Counsel, Mr. Robert Marvin, uh, appears for the respondent. It's an appeal for the order of Mrs. Justice Stain of the 29th of September of last year. Um, as it, that itself was an appeal from um, Master Megalingam in the Costs Office, uh, permission was granted by Lord Justice Coulson on the 30th of September, this being a second appeal uh, with regard to the two tier test of prospects and also wider public importance. And I'm grateful to the court for hearing this matter so quickly following that permission being granted, sorry, 30th of November last year, permission being granted then. And can I just set out our position um, on this appeal so the court knows uh, exactly what we're saying? Our, our, our first point is that we are not in breach uh, in drafting this bill of any rule of court or practice direction uh, in formulating that bill of costs, and certainly not to want to strike out and require redrafting of the bill. The that, that seems to encapsulate two points. I thought when you said your, it was going to be your first point, it would be simply we are not in breach. It, yes. Uh, when you add in, even if we were, um, there shouldn't be a strike out, that sounds like a second point. Well, let, let, let me build it into my second point. I'm grateful for you indicating the law because um, it, it, it should not require redrafting of the bill because our second point is we provided a bill that has both functionality and does have detail and transparency in both the paper and the electronic bill. I'm grateful to the Lord. That really is part of the second point. Sorry to interrupt. Can I just ask, um, when you say you are not in breach, were you given permission to appeal against the finding in relation to the signature on the breach on the bill? Uh, I didn't, we didn't apply for that. No, and therefore there was a breach. Uh, my Lord, yes, on the certification yeah. point. We, we, yeah. we take that point. But that was remedied um, by the signature with a, a named partner certifying the bill. But on the new bill? Uh, yes, but it, it, if, if the old bill had stood, it would simply it would have been the front sheet of the certificate being no, signed by a named that. partner. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, my Lord, you, thank you for... Sorry. Isn't the whole question whether or not you are in breach? Isn't it a question of what 5.211 means and what Details statement means for paper bill, uh, electronic bills. Can you state that you are not in breach? You can only state on your submission of what the rules mean you're not in breach, aren't you, at this stage? Uh, if yes, you're in, you my lord, yes, but then we, I'd hope uh, that my statement of our position encamp encapsulates that. Oh, right. Um, for clarity, in the third point I make is that we have provided the relative, in both paper and the electronic bill we provided the relative status of the Fianna and the relative Supreme Court Office, Senior Court Office guide grade uh, for both the paper and the e-bills. Those being the two words that are dealt with by the learned judge in a judgment. Um, when, when you say you provided this, do you mean you provided them in the original electronic bill and the original paper bill or you provided them now? We pro no, we provided them um, my lord, when Bill is served, points of dispute are raised. Now, in this particular case, full points of dispute were not raised by the respondent. They took five preliminary points that went to the issues dealt with by both of the judges below. And in responding to those points, particularly as to whether we had provided enough information, and I'll take you to the relevant page, my lord, we also provided, as well as the status of the FIANA, we also provided the uh, relevant grade. Uh, a, B, My C, fault. D. Don't, don't worry about that. Stage one, you're sitting in your office, you're drafting the paper bill of costs. Yes. Uh, stage two, you're doing the electronic bill of costs. In yes. the electronic bill of costs, did you or did you not include something which could be called the grade or did you leave the column empty? Uh, not within the bill. Oh, the, the, right, grade, the grade was dealt with um, in dealing with the paper bill of costs and that's the point I wish to raise with your lordships. So when you say they were provided, you mean provided after the bill or not? That's what I'm trying to get at. You're making provided, statements, and I'm trying to get what you mean. Um, provided after the original bill, but provided still after the bill, yeah, but yes, still yes. prior to any hearing before Master Maglingham. That's helpful. So after the bill, but before any hearing. Yeah. And and, and just by way of explanation, my lord, um, you may be well aware of it, but. Um, the approval order of this um, quantum case was back on the 7th of March 2019 by way of lump sum and periodical payments. Now, once it's approved by the court, it's out with the court system. The parties go off to try and um, deal with their costs. It comes back into the court system 
by way of a notice of commencement. And um, uh, that is at page 50 of the supplementary bundle for your note. Now, it's, it's a million pound bill. Um, like, bottom Should line. we be looking at that? Well, d just, just to simply state, the notice of commencement, I, I would invite you to just, uh, look at that, my lord, for this reason. But page 35 in the bottom right hand corner of my bundle, it's headed Notice of Commencement Assessment of Bill of Costs. And you'll see it has to refer to the order, and it does in the first line of the 7th of March, 2019. And it says, I have prepared my bill of costs, and the total bill is 1,034,000 odd. Now, the important thing, my lord, is the notice of commencement provides one bill for the quantum case. The fact that it is divided into a paper bill, roughly about £310,000 worth of the cost. And then also provided by way of e-bill for um, the remaining sum, although uh, there we're dealing with uh, budgeted costs, etc., so it becomes more complicated. But the fact of the matter is that the notice of commencement only provides one bill. So although we're looking at paper bill and electronic bill, it's one bill of costs. And indeed, uh, the evidence is, I don't need to take you to it, but Ms. Whitaker, um, in her statement at the end of the supplementary bundle, explains she had to corrupt the um, electronic bill she's working on to actually include parts, include phases, etc., to deal with the budgeted costs. Because she had to have budget, certain phase and activities within the budget, certain phase and activities out with the budget, and in some of the phases they were in excess of the budget. So on her own evidence, there's, there's not a, no issue over this, she was already having to um, play around with this bill. Now, the uh, application uh, was to strike out the whole bill of costs, both paper and electronic. That's at page one of the supplementary bundle. And it's simply stated, it is, uh, no rule is referred to, it's simply stated on page one in the application notice of the supplementary bundle, the first document, paragraph one. The claimant's bill of costs served with a notice of commencement dated the 8th of August 2019 to stand struck out for non compliance with the civil procedure rules. And then it goes on to say, but you've got to do a new one which is compliant. One and two together, it's clear what they're trying to do. Yes, just that for it to be redrafted. It's not okay. saying you can't have your costs, but they're saying because of practicality it should be struck out. But it is still a, an application to strike out the Lord with all the uh, costs and work consequences involved. Now, that, there was a wholesale attack upon this bill in, by way of an additional witness statement as well, dealing with its functionality. It was also Ms. Whitaker dealt with in evidence. And what this case is really boiled down to is the functionality of not having the, uh, we say, not having the name of the FIANA uh, in the bill. Now, the paper bill itself, I don't know if your lordships have had actually a chance to uh, see the uh, paper bill. It's uh, this is the supplementary bundle at page 61. And in particular, page 61, it's giving the hourly rates. Sorry, six, page six, 61 of the does supplementary it not begin bundle. at page 51? Um, yes, my numbering is slightly. Uh, or P36. It begins at P36. It's got narrative for many pages, as you may expect, the case such a serious as this is the brain injury. Yes. Um, but in particular, I'm drawing your attention to what would be your Lordship's page 46. Yes, I see. Uh, and there is... I've got different numbers now. You, you give three numbers. I've got a number at the top, page 51, and then... At various stages, they've got numbers at the bottom. Which number do you want us to use? The top right-hand corner or the bottom right-hand corner? I, I think the Lord, let's just, Lord just and you and I are looking at the bottom uh, of the yeah. page. Okay. But, but I'm wondering, actually, whether that is wise, because if I look on in the bundle, there are... It's not oh, no, I don't... Perhaps we do get a P number for every page. But it might be safer to use the top right-hand number. The top right of this bundle's number. Yeah. Which is page 51. <coughs> 
Uh, and there you have the uh, cost, part one, cost of the claimant incurred for a specific period, uh, July. And uh, it goes, um, for this paper bill, it's set out over those other two uh, pages with regards to periods, with regards to the, whether it's a solicitor or other, uh, Fianna, and uh, with regards to their experience. And that is a similar format that's also used within the electronic bill with regard to uh, S1 or S2, uh, etc. Sorry to ask yeah. a, a question. So when we've got the second entry down, it says trainee solicitor, others trainee solicitor, and then if you drop down to um, sort of uh, five, five, six down, mm -hmm. you've got others trainee solicitors. Mm -hmm. Are those the same people or different people? Uh, yeah, the rate that there'll be the same there'll be the same category of people and the rate's gone up because the the period um same category of people or person um because there's obviously a difference between one person and people uh yes and this was pointed out there's an, actually an overlap there with regard to um to the first of april to the 30th of april so hang on hang on to date no, that, that's another point. It is. J just to, uh, answer me if that's all right. Um, whether these are the same people, same person, or whether these are more than one person in the others and trainee solicitor paralegal. There'll be more. There'll be more than one person. There'll be more than one. Yes. My lord, I mean, it may well be, and uh, I know uh, Master Ray maybe assist the court that um, when you're coming to these bills of this type, one is very interested in the grade A fee and the grade B fee and. And you're also very interested, in my experience, of working out whether there's been duplication. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's why I wondered whether it was one person or, or, or two. Because obviously, if I give you, as a paralegal, three hours' work to do, one hour's reading in, fine, we all live with that. But if I then give it to the person sitting behind you to do again, with another hour reading in, I need to know who's in there on the bill before I can take a point about duplication. Well, um, with respect to the law, you can take the point about duplication, your point of dispute, you can actually say on the bill, uh, three hours spent dealing with documents, and then another three hours spent dealing with documents. Uh, uh, you can raise that in the points of dispute, query duplication, and that can be answered and by... And how will the master answer it without knowing who did what? The master won't answer it. It'll be, if it's raised in the points of dispute, the uh, appellant, or the claimant, has a right to the points of reply. Yeah. And he will then, if it's raised as a point of dispute, the appellant can say, no, two different fee owners dealing with two different tasks. Then, if we take that sequence all the way through... Well, why go through um, the process of raising a point of dispute when, in fact, they are the same person? Um, query duplication, because you've not given me the details, to realise that there is no duplication at the start. Why should I raise a point of dispute that you then come back to saying, actually, you're wrong? Well, because this often happens, my lord, as to, um, uh, with regard to the bill, as to uh, raising whether, in fact, there are two different people doing a task, whether they're doing the same task, whether one person, is, in your own lordship's example, is doing the same task as another Fianna has just done. And the only way you'll necessarily get into that is uh, if it comes to an issue, if the case isn't settled, the uh, cost judge or the reasonable judge will be able to um, look at the papers and see what's happening. Thank you. But this just is a factual question. I just want to know a factual answer. Looking at pages, top right hand corners, 61 and 62, yeah. I see reference to solicitor one, solicitor two, and solicitor three, with, in some cases, different levels of experience. Does that mean there were only three solicitors, and although they were called solicitor one, two, and three, they represent one person, or is there a category of solicitor one person, and a category of solicitor two person, and a category of solicitor three person? So, for example, on Solicitor 1, there were two partners involved. So even Solicitor 1 is a category, not an individual? Correct. Thank you. If I'm wrong, I'll be, no doubt, be tugged from behind. But, uh, <laughs> but, uh, so all of these are categories, not persons? They are categories. Yeah. Uh, yes. And um, when the points of dispute were raised in a very limited form in this case, as to the form uh, of, of the bill, uh, there was uh, replies using your page numbers, my lords. Um, those replies to the points of suit begin at page 130. It's in landscape, I'm afraid, so run over. Uh, 
various points are raised um, as to well, miscertification, um, particularly if I take page 132, preliminary point 3. Um, it deals with practice direction 5.112 and uh, what should be included in the paper bill. And it goes on for some pages where the complaints are made. Uh, to the bottom, to page 134, in fact, when the receiving party replies in a much more short form way and uh, states um, at the, on page 134, my lords, the bill complies with information detailed in the extract provided above from Cook that was quoted against them. The claimants had lost as to why the defendant seeking further information on the same is clearly before them. There's no required to requirement to provide the name of the fee earners within the bill of costs, and it quotes. 57, uh, 511. But then, my lord, the point I made earlier, which uh, my lord Lord Spears um, uh, was interested in, was um, for clarification at the end of this reply, the post-qualification experience, which is relevant to the fee one may be charging, is clearly identified, but for clarification, it's then set out next to each of the categories of fee earners. So, i.e. next to the status of the fee earner, you then get the grade of the SCCO grade, yeah. The hourly rate, the, the guideline hourly rate uh, nomenclature uh, that uh, gives you each bracket of fee earner. Can I ask, um, because it's not really apparent from the materials that we've read so far, why wouldn't you give the name on a bill? What is the point of principle that is so important that we should say you shouldn't give a name? Well, my lord, I think our argument is the mirror image of that, is uh, <laughs> the requirement under the uh, uh, rules, um, we say, does not require to give a name, save for the only reference... I'll come to your, answer your question, but I don't want to sound like a politician, but the only reference to a name is in one column in the President S under practice direction. But yes. um, it all depends upon... Um, can be dependent on what system you're running. You may have also seen the further information given in this case, having run for some years, of the uh, reply to Part 18 requests with a number of fee owners who were involved in this particular case. Mm. There at page 175. Yeah. Um, so I'm 30-odd. Now, um, I read a comment somewhere saying, amazingly, but not really, because you can have grade D coming in while someone's not on and, and doing six minutes of work, for example, or, or, or slightly longer, and then going off again, so they're on, they're on the bill. But as a point of principle, um, I would forecast, my lord, it's not our case that we raise to raise with sort of the point of principle that you don't have to give the names. We are saying by not giving the names, we're not in breach of what we're required to provide as long as there's sufficient information there. Well, that's the key point. The question is, is it enough to give categories, or does there have to be something that indicates how many people within that category and which of those people within the category did the various work? My Lord, yes, and when it comes that's to... Really, and that's the question of the interpretation of 5.11, really. Yes, and when it comes, certainly when it comes to the electronic bill, our position is that the functionality of the bill will reveal that uh, very swiftly. We, we serve that um, table of examples upon the call which we're happy to take you through, but one example to show that when you are able to uh, delve into the electronic bill and, and, and um, choose whatever particular uh, data you require, uh, it is possible to see which category particularly and, and to how many of that category were doing uh, a particular task. Can, complaint, sorry, my lord. Can I know whether it is actually Joe Bloggs, Category 1, who read the letter on the 1st of May, but it was Mary Doe who read the same letter on the 2nd of May, or do I simply know that a category whatever solicitor read it on the 1st and a category uh, ex solicitor read it on the 2nd? That's what I'd like to know. You will know the category, and when we're dealing with solicitor one, we're dealing with a handful, not even a handful of people, two partners, I think, in the legal executive with over eight years' experience. But it's a category, it's more than one. And therefore, will I know 
that the same person within the category has read it or that a different person in the category has read it? No, not until you ask the question. Until I ask the question. Okay, that's what I wanted to I, know. I've forgotten quite how your worked examples work, so I did go through them. My recollection was that where you really ran into more than one person with the electronic bills was at the grade D type level. I thought yes. with the solicitors you could identify individual people. Yes. Yes, and that is that is um, a feature of, of these bills particularly. Let, let's take this mainstream common law personal injury litigation, catastrophic injury as it's now called. You will, and I forecast that any cost judge trying this will be interested in where big hourly rates are. We're looking at now um, on the latest guideline rates, 373 for pun, and that's just guidelines. So it could well be 400 um, upwards. So the court's going to be wanting to know where the, the big ticket items necessarily are. Um, with the grade grade D, there can be a lot of um, people doing similar, not saying the same work, my lord, but a lot of people, uh, the troops, so to speak, doing a lot of uh, the mean, more menial tasks, dealing with matters, that uh, the court, and indeed the opponent, may not be so interested. And I take your Lordship's point. Thank you for going through those, through those examples. But, but you're right when you get to the partner level, but then when you get to solicitor one level, you've got more, solicitor two level, you've got even more, and solicitor three level, where quite a lot of the bill is, um, for understandable reasons, um, uh, there's quite a lot of money in, in, in each of those lots. Yes, I think we're actually starting with S1 and then working our way down, my Lord, yeah. but I take your point. Absolutely, take the point as you go further down. And the question is really what, what, the, what the opponent requires, or indeed what the court requires when it comes to detailed assessment, because they are the final arbiter. The question for that then is to look at the rules and see whether they allow what you've done, categories of individuals. Um, my lord, yes, thank you for the nudge. <laughs> it was not for me. I just had to work out what we're trying to decide, because we look at all these worked examples, and I'm just trying to work out what our job is. And they well, my, my Lord, if, if I can just address that, my primary, my primary duty before this court is to my um, professional client who represents the lay client, and it is that this bill is, is, is satisfactory in, in accordance with the rules, and there is no breach. It's satisfactory because of no breach, it's satisfactory because it's functional. However, I noticed the words of, of course, Lord Justice Coulson with regard to the profession does have conflicting decisions. So in this very case alone, we have Master Naglingham who went through this at the first hearing. I, I can assess this bill. We have a different view in the, in the court below. So, <coughs> um, my primary con concern is with regard to my clients. Of course, my duty is also to assist the court where I can as, as to the functionality and, and proper interpretation of these rules. And it may well be whatever the court decides in this particular case may wish to give some guidance with regard to the rules <coughs> as they're drafted by the Rules Committee. Um, to that end, um, my lord, can I? Uh, um, it's in various places, and may I be so bold as to say that Mrs. Justice Stain set out accurately and comprehensively every um, reference material that was laid before her. And I'm content to take you to the judgment of Mrs. Justice Stain, because then we can move forward to how she dealt with those particular materials herself. Uh, with regard to the core bundle. Uh, her judgments at, I have it at tab 9, page 64 onwards. The, I just lost my notes, jumping forward. We're dealing with the actual um, rules of the court at uh, page 72 onwards, paragraph 43 in her judgment, but she deals with what we have to deal with first in my respectful submission, the paper bills of paragraph 51. And the paragraph 51, my lord, he recites paragraph 511, which um, I think we've all just recently received about 2022 white books is the same. Um, and, and she sets it, she sets it out uh, here uh, with her own underlining, which I'm grateful. 
background information, including the bill of costs, should set out to um, <coughs> a statement of the status of the legal representative's employee in respect of whom costs are claimed and the hourly rates claimed for each such person. And, um, my, my Lord, I, I do just draw your attention to paragraph 52, because uh, there is a precedent at the end of the tax direction, only available online, I, I should warn the court, but President A actually sets out how that's presented in their um, President Bill, and you'll see at the top of the next page, it's, it's category, it's partner, assistant solicitor, and other PM. And there's an example paragraph that states who had the majority of the work. So, my Lord, in our submission, um, when it deals with the paper bills, that uh, our submission is that the learned judge was mistaken when she said it had to have the identity and the name of the particular employee uh, given. Well, well, what I don't know from President A, and this that you just didn't do, EF and Co., I just don't know whether there was, in fact, only one partner and only one sister sister in the mind of the person who drafted President A, because it says that, uh, except for the contrary of the state of the proceedings were conducted on behalf of the claimant by Anne, which you says could be more than one, but admitted in November 2008, and I just wonder whether that precedent uses what you call categories, because that person had in mind that the category and the number were the same. There was one partner, there was one assistant solicitor, but it does refer to other fee owners, I suppose. Yes, it does. Um, I mean, it, it could have could have said partner brackets Mr. Smith, close brackets. Yes, yeah. um, or it could have said partner brackets or partners. <laughs> precisely, it's yeah. president. So do I know what it was meant to mean that president A? This is the difficulty, my lord, with presidents in the practice directions as opposed to precise rules of court. Mm. That um, one is uh, dealing with this bill in this format, and uh, I would uh, venture to suggest, and uh, I'll be guided by those who assist you on the bench, that this has been the format um, uh, for very many years, not decades, as to how these paper bills have been presented. And, and just to understand how the precedents come in, if you look back to the judge's judgment at paragraph 44, where she quotes paragraph 5.1 of the practice direction, you see just after her underlining says precedents A, B, C, and D in the schedule the model forms of paper bills and costs for detailed assessment. So that's how they come in. Yes, my lord, yes. As I say, they're online only as far as I can ascertain. Yeah. And you have to have the date from April 2018, 6th April 2018 when, because of the divide, paper bills before then and electronic bills after then. Yes. So my lord, that, that, that's, that, that's as much as it is. Now, in um, presenting this appeal on the paper aspect of the bill, she deals with it at paragraph 91 in her judgment. <coughs> and um, no criticism, she tees herself up with three questions as to whether, uh, in paragraph 91, that provision we've read requires the name of each Vienna each fee earner's SCC, SCCO grade, and each fee earner's professional qualification and years of post-qualification experience, if any. Um, I, I would suggest, my lord, that actually a, a, B and C run together, because you either have the grade that's going to tell you what the post-qualification experience or qualification is, right, if it's a solicitor, or solicitor of more than eight years, or you can have the information by way of actually stating it in words. As, as it transpires, she, uh, her finding, and you will have read, my lords, was she said A and C should be in a paper bill of costs, but not B, for the reason she gives. And my lord, you, you have our, our first point of appeal, which is <coughs> paragraph 92, her opening line is, the starting point of paragraph 5.11.2 does not expressly require the name of the fee owners to be provided. Now, um, I'm not bold in saying that actually, um, that should have been the end of it. Not really, because isn't she saying it doesn't use the word 
uh, when she says express, and although she says implied, what she's saying is when you read the whole and construe it properly, it does require it. If we forgot the words express and imply, we wouldn't have it. So isn't that really not the answer? Uh, well, it's a point I take, my lord, it's and I can see it's not going to not set out, <laughs> but it's not the end of the case, is it? I'm not saying it's the end of the case, my lord. I says it could be the end of the case because if the, if one is facing a strike out for breach of the practice direction, albeit redraft the bill, uh, there is we say first and foremost there is no express term, so the sequence that has to follow um, has to be correct. We say that actually following it through is flawed as to whether by she describes the ordinary rules of interpretation having regard to the purpose of the provision, such requirements are implied. The, um, we have no disagreement with um, paragraph 93 in, 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 the, in the sense of um, the words, she acknowledges the words uh, status have to be provided, of each fear and they have to be provided, and she also acknowledges that the word is used as should as opposed to must, uh, and we say those are matters the point in our favour. Does the should really take one anywhere? Sorry, my lord? You say you rely on the fact it says should not must. I wonder whether that point really goes anywhere. Um, um, well, it may. In, in your bundle, you have the case of Ainsworth, where you're dealing with um, uh, tab 18 points of dispute on particular parts of the bill must be particularised and, and must be set out. And uh, they were not dealt with um, in that way, with the practice direction that said must be, and the um, senior cost judge was upheld in appeal, that they were mandatory words. Uh, here, uh, the words are not necessarily mandatory, but it's perhaps more important for this court as to determine what do the actual words mean. I mean, I follow that, but if we just go back to paragraphs 50 and 51, where the judge has set out what the, the practice direction says, um, so 5.7, it says a bill of costs may consist of, as appropriate, to background information. And then paragraph 5.11, quoted in paragraph 51, we get the background information included in the bill of costs should set out various things. Yes. Does it, is it really of any significance if it says should rather than must? Uh, no, because I'm, I'm, I'm happy to accept that on the interpretation we put forward under paragraph, subparagraph 2, we should provide the status, we should provide the hourly rates. Yes. Yep. Now, she does mention at paragraph 93, District Judge Warden and Sharp and Aviva, which we do distinguish and Nelson Mann and Nagaling distinguish because it was dealing with blended rates where it was important to know the particular fairness. But she goes on in paragraph 94, my lord, um, to give two reasons uh, as to, well, start, start of two reasons as to why she says um, it should be an individual basis rather than a category. First, she says, the language of 51112, which refers to the state of the employee <coughs> in respect of whom costs are claimed and the hourly rates for each such employee. My lords, it doesn't matter for your lordships, but our re representation to the court today is um, it doesn't actually require the uh, legal, re legal representative employee name at all. It requires the status of that employee. That, that is the wording of the rule, the status. But the status of what the person or the category? Well, if you wouldn't have the status of an employee on there, my lord, if they didn't do work on the bill. So if a person did work, if an employee of a solicitor's firm did work on the bill, the, their status should be given, as in the president, if it's a partner, if it's an assistant solicitor, or if it's paralegal, for example. So it's the status of people in that category that have to be given? It is that, yes. The, the, it, it, it has to be the status of someone, you see. It has to be status of the employee who is working on the bill or employees. So, for example, my lord, just, just to clarify, the status being the name of the, the category that they are. As I called the nominative earlier, we've seen it in this very bill. It may be a solicitor, it may be a partner, it may be an assistant solicitor. When it comes to grade, SCCO grade, 
that may delve further in as to what, how many post years qualification, for example. Because but looking at 5.11.2, it doesn't say the hourly rate is claimed for each such category. It seems to be assuming there's an individual. That's the point I think the judge is making. The status of the employee and the hourly rates claimed for each such person. So yes, it has to be the status and the hourly rate. But those aren't in the abstract. It's got to be the status and hourly rates of something. And the yeah. question surely is, is it the category or it is, or is it the individual, however identified? Well, it's the category, my lord, because as you yourself have observed over the page in the present, it just says other fee earners charged out at 118 an hour. Well, that's using the, 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 the form, you're right, um, but that's Thank using you. the precedent, as it were, to interpret um, 511 itself. Yes. We're looking at the, the wording. The, the precedent, um, uh, I mean, in some respects, it's a helpful guide, but it's not the wording. See, my lord, you, I, I take your point, my lord. But you could have a solicitor who is fairly newly qualified, and you can have a solicitor uh, who has more experience, and they will be on different hourly rates. So, as we, those who instruct me had in their bill, you can have a solicitor up to four years post qualification, for example, or up to eight years post qualification. Or you can have a solicitor over that period, and that will reflect a higher rate. And I would submit that that approach uh, is compliant with 511.2. Because it's the status of the employee, say you're up to four years qualification, post qualification, and it's the rate for that particular employee, without necessarily having to name that person within the bill. And why do they say each, then? What's the, why do they put each? Because, you, because, my lord, in my example, you may have a two, two, assistors, two assistance solicitors uh, of, of different qualification, or even a paralegal who's so experienced in the job, they may be commanding a far higher hourly rate with their experience, or a um, legal executive who is qualified will command a higher rate, as opposed to a legal executive who has not yet passed through exams. So, my lord, with, with, within these categories, you do have different. Within the names of uh, fee earners in a solicitor's firm, you do have differing rates of pay per hour according to their experience. That's why it has to be differentiated for each such person. You can't simply say legal exec or assistant solicitors. I mean, as a matter of fact, President Day does just say assistant solicitor. <laughs> that may be because the assistant solicitor is then defined as assistant solicitor admitted in November 2008. Would explain the hourly rate being claimed. Your best may from the president is the other fee earners because we don't know whether President A drafts person thought it was one partner and one assistant solicitor. The fact they've given the date suggests they were thinking of somebody. But you would say when you get to other fee earners, that's got to be a category, and therefore the president must have contemplated that categories were not forbidden. This is your best point, I just thought that. Um, my lord, the second reason the learned judge gave is in the following paragraph, uh, paragraph uh, 95, where she um, is critical, saying, um, I'll read it, she's interpreting purposely a bill of costs in which claims are made for work done by reference to categories of fee earners, rather than by specifying the work undertaken by each individual fee earner, is intolerably opaque. It results in the paying party and the assessing judge being unable to consider all of the circumstances when reaching the conclusion the amount of cost likely to be so awarded when applying 44.4. And in short, my lord, that is in all the circumstances of the case. She then goes on to give an example of that 
uh, which I think Malone Lord just Stringman touched upon earlier, for example, uh, as to two different Fianna's within the same status. But that, my Lord, um, may be uh, a consequence of uh, the drafting, but I, I would submit that it is not, uh, does not give rise to purposive construction to say, well, it, it actually displaces the wording of the uh, practice direction itself. And um, intolerably opaque is a very strong uh, word when, in practice, these bills have been um, presented, settled, negotiated and settled, or, or heard by the um, cost corridor, judges in the cost corridor, for, for a long period of time. Um, for completeness, my lord, she does... Sorry, that, that last submission, you, you were suggesting that the practice of not giving fianas, has, um, the individual fianas, has gone on for a long period of time. Or yes, yes. Right. Following, following the um, stating the status and the hourly rate has been common practice. But then the subject of the contrary decisions that you refer to, Sharp and Aviva, and which you distinguish. I distinguish, and that's the, really the only one that um, uh, is, is against us, which Martin Nagelingdon distinguished uh, on the basis of uh, it was dealing with a, a d different situation where, because it was a blended hourly rate, it, it cried out for who was doing what when. Whereas uh, we say in the, in the general scheme of things and in the bill before you. I mean, with a blended rate, you are not giving the rate for anybody. Um, um, my lord, well, if I, um, she does touch, to be fair to the London judge, she does touch a paragraph 98 upon the other, other Fiona's matter, but that did not persuade her away from the two reasons she, she gave. Now, my lord, um, paragraph 99 and 100, she actually delves there, and 101, she she goes there into why the SCCO grade itself uh, is, is not particularly required. Um, before though going on to say that um, in paragraph 101, the, the description uh, should accomplish their professional qualifications for experience. Now, I'm not sure if I need to deal with the SCCO grade, Lord, in fact, because in this case, we actually you have the point, my lord, at the outset of this hearing, that we had given them uh, in reply to the point of dispute. Not in the bill. <coughs> Not in the bill. I mean, aren't, aren't we concerned with the bill? Does it help you if you give them later, if it's not in the bill? Well, it's, 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 it's the uh, line of argument I advance, my lord, <coughs> that if there are queries, as I discussed with my lord, Lord Justice England, about well, what if there's a sign of duplication here, that can be raised in the point of but don't we have to decide whether it complies with the bill, uh, with the rules first? So don't we have to decide what status means and what has to be included? Can we just dodge that and say, well, it wouldn't matter because they were told at some stage before the hearing and everything was all right on the night? No, and it so happens if they were given some screen, she doesn't find it as a requirement in this bill. What she no, no, I understand that, but I mean, can we just say, well, it didn't matter because by the time it got to the master, they could have found out they'd had lots of answers. I mean, I really, don't we have to decide whether the bill complied with the rules? Uh, actually, the practice direction. Or the practice direction, yeah. yeah. Um, I accept that. But if I can just be clear, though, that it's not a question, in these cases, it's not a question of getting to the master. Yeah. Don't worry about the details of what I've got wrong. The substance is, do you or do you not have to ensure that you comply with the words of the page of the practice direction? Except that. That's the key question. And my point was quite clearly, you seem to be saying that things that came after the bill solved the problem. And my point to you was, doesn't the bill itself have to comply with the practice direction? And going off on other tangents, does My really answer to you, my Lord, is that? yes. yes and that okay. this has occurred in the bill to the page I took you to, yep. because where it sets out, each of the solicitor one, solicitor two, etc., it, it, it's talking about uh, post years qualification, etc. So you say that status does mean qualification experience pre and post for categories. 
So there are two separate questions. What does status mean in this rule? And you say it is, she's right to say that it's um, their number of years of pre and post qualification experience, but it can be can be done by categories in the bid. Is that your case or not? Yes. Right, okay, just so I understand it. So you, you accept that the judge was right to say that by requiring status, um, uh, somebody putting in a bill has to give uh, professional qualification and number of years of post-qualification experience, or not? Uh, my lord, um, by the word status, yes, yeah, she, she actually distinguishes between status and grade status. It, it quite. I'm, I'm dealing with well, If you give grade, well, that may be good enough, but if we just focus on the word status, which yes. is what the practice direction requires. Yes. Um, as I understand it, the judge proceeds on the basis that status means you've got to give professional qualification of any, uh, and if you don't give the grade, the number of years of post-qualification experience. Now, is that accepted? Uh, th th that is accepted. I mean, it, strangely enough, from the president, it, it, it's, it's not what they put in. No, but I see that. The fact of the matter is, if you give the SCCO grade, you use a colloquialism, or you kill two birds with one stone, but yes, there's none. I understand that. If you give the, the SC, SCCO grade, it may be that you've given the information necessary for status. But going back to status, status doesn't require you to give the SECO grade, but if you do that, you may give the information necessary for status. Yes. So that leads you back to the simple question, which I think you've answered, that your submission is that status means you must give the professional qualification and the post-qualification experience. Bracket. You may do that if you give it by grade, but if you don't do it by it that way, you've got to do it another way. I mean, even though... The but that's what you say status means, is it? Her ladyship accepts that as well. There's a, we're an item on that, because she says, right. if the SCCO grade's not given, give the additional material. Right. So, so, so just to be absolutely clear, you say that the information we get at page 61 onwards in the supplemental bundle sufficiently gives the status. Yes. Because it says solicitor with over four years' experience or whatever. Yeah. And it goes further than the example given in the practice direction. And, and that's the second point. Uh, even though the even though Preston A doesn't go as far as this, you would accept that by requiring status you have to give that sort of information rather than merely what you see in the Preston A. Yes. And ca can I ex just explain why matters may have moved on? It may have been in the old days that a partner as a solicitor of seven years' experience, and that may have sufficed originally. But you can now have partners who aren't necessarily qualified. So, um, out of abundance of caution, I'm, one takes that approach while this rule is still alive. And it's got to be status of a category on your argument. So, it's people who have the qualification of solicitors and at least eight years experience or four years experience or whatever is the definition because some who've got at least eight years experience may have 10 or 12 but that's not going to be relevant you say it's great right well great d could be a paralegal a trainee etc yeah but because you're giving the status of a category and you said that status is professional qualification and post qualification experience you're giving those for a category but within the category not everyone will have the same actual post Qualification experience. Well, it, it must be enough if you give the minimum post qualification. Everybody in that category has at least eight years' experience or at least four years or whatever it is. That must be what you're saying, is it? Yeah. Yeah. And that's how it's been dealt with in this bill with regard to solicitor one, solicitor two, <coughs> etc., going down. Both in paper, as I say, it's the same bill. Now, I think we've more or less got to the point where, on status, you and the judge seem to be in agreement. But then, in uh, paragraph 104, the judge says you didn't comply with what uh, was required. No. Um, and plainly, you're at odds on whether or not each individual had to be named. We are. Um, uh, that apart, the judge, I think, still take, proceeds on the basis that you haven't sufficiently indicated status. Um, 
Well, she certainly not. Uh, she certainly was against us on um, item one, the name. Yeah. That would have sufficed alone, one forecast as to her finding. On two, the hourly rates are given, and on three, um, what, what, she's saying the paper bill did not. This paper bill did not comply with the specific requirements to specify, and indeed she goes through all three of what she finds must be specified: name, hourly rate, and status. Well, that, that, in our respect, from that can't necessarily be right. I mean, she's, if the name she's found has to be given, we have failed on that front in her judgment. But hourly rate we have given, and, and we say we have given status. Can I just understand where you, you, you differ from the judge on, the, on that? In paragraph 101, the judge says to give status, you've got to give professional qualification, if any, and number of years of post-qualification experience. And then in paragraph 104, as I understand it, she says you haven't complied on status. And she says that you have to give professional qualification a number of years of post-qualification experience. Um, so on, as regards status, where are you and the judge different? Uh, my Lord, it's difficult to say because we're differing on hourly rates as well. I'm mean, not avoiding your question, but she said for these three reasons, it hasn't been complied with. Name, I accept, is a clear discrepancy between us. Yes. Hourly rates we say we have given, and we say we have given, we have given, uh, status. So we, were, we are not ad item on, on, on that matter. So just trying to interpret what the judge had in mind. Um, I mean, you're going back to page 61. We know about the professional qualifications of the solicitors. Um, uh, we know in respect to the solicitors that you've given uh, years of post-qualification experience. Um, it, it is the flaw that in respect of the others, you haven't said whether or not they are fellows of the Chartered Institute of Legal Executives or, 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 or there? Well, th they were all... Difficult to hear, they'll all be going to grade D. You'll have your solicitor one, who has eight years post qualification experience, as stated. You'll have your solicitor two, who has four years post qualification experience. And then you will have a grade D, who could be a paralegal, could be a trainee, um, uh, could be a litigation assistant. And because they are grade D, they have, may have no experience, and no qualification. So by stating the negative, we would say we will not state the negative. We can't be in breach of the rule as our position. So just going back then to 101, where I thought you, you and the judge were in agreement, but I wonder whether it's actually the case. Yeah. Um, uh, 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 the judge says it has to encompass professional qualification, if any, and number of years of post-qualification experience. And where I think we're getting to, until you tell me that I'm wrong, is that you say in relation to your grade D people, the residual category, you don't actually have to say whether or not they have a professional qualification. You don't have to say how many years experience they have. I'm sorry not to make that more clear, my lord. But that, but that, 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 is, that, that is. as a matter of practicality must be the case, yes. That's our position. Well, why did you have to do for those then? I'm sorry, my lord? Why don't you have to give the post the qualification and the post-qualification experience. This is what I come back to with uh, the grade D. It, it could be um, that, excuse my words carefully, that they are, that they are uh, the workers on, on the matter who may have no experience, may have some experience, but they are going to be at one level of, of the grade D. So, so the cost charge can proceed on the basis that they are the lowest category. Uh, they are not to be not to have attributed to them any qualification or particular experience. But some of them may have a qualification, as I understand it. Well, if they have, my lord, um, you got to assure the solicitor would be billing them out at the appropriate rate. If they had taken their legal executive exams, for example, they would be at a higher rate. Uh, if they had a, if they had such qualifications or experience that they would be billing at a higher and higher rate, they would have to set that out and justify that. There's an implication from paragraph, if they, so page 61, we know that they haven't got any qualification, 
And we know that they haven't got any qualifi post qualification experience by definition, because they haven't got a qualification. And that's why it's set out. It's not that there are some people in the category of uh, paralegals no. who've got it, they just can't be any. Well, a trainee solicitor may may well have a degree, but that's not not that's not going to get them a professional up. qualification. Yeah, they're not going to get them up into the higher hourly rate. And that's what it's about. So, so given the obligation to uh, 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 specify a qualification, if you rely on one, where none is specified, one infers that there is no relevant qualification. So you're claiming the lowest rate at grade two. That's right. Well, look, thank you for that clarification. I'm sorry, I apologise to the court if I wasn't clear on uh, where I was or not in disagreement with the manager. So none of the paralegals that worked on this case had any qualification, any professional qualification at all then? Not such as to claim a higher hourly rate, no. no. And the, I mean, trainees solicitor, it's more than just actually passing, um, you know, having a degree. They would have passed the law society exams. Yes, but in the in the ranking of hourly rate charges. No, no, I, I appreciate that. Yeah. But what you do by putting equivalence between that is take a person off the street. I'm not for a moment suggesting that's happened in this case. Um, a person off the street and give them the same rate as a trainee solicitor at £155. It's, it does not come back, my lord. I take, take your point absolutely. If it comes and, and, that, and that's actually why, I mean, I, I understand you say you, you comply and they say you don't, so we'll have to decide that. Yes. But I also understand, don't understand why it became such an issue not to say who was working on the bill. I understand, my lord, that is an issue for you. Yeah. But going back to paragraph, uh, paragraph 51 and uh, 511.2, it, it, that discussion may um, enlighten the court's approach or, or understanding of having to state the status and the hourly rate claim. Because the two go hand in hand. They are, they are, they are conjunctive. They, you cannot claim the higher hourly rate unless your status justifies it. Well, speaking for myself, I would start with the rules. I don't think I would work back and say the rates follow from the status. If you've got the hourly rates, it must be the status to that. It does say a statement of the status yes. and the hourly rates claimed. It may well be that the rates follow from the status, but you can't just assume that you're the same. You've got to give both, haven't you? Yes. yes. And you say you've done it for trainee solicitors because the word trainees, I imagine, a trade solicitor, you say, will it include the fact that they pass their, uh, their law college exams. And you're saying for paralegals, we must assume that none of them have any qualification because had they had a qualification, they would have had to state it. And you say, because in your world, Status and grade go together. Uh, status and rate go together. Therefore, it must be the case. You say that when this bill is read, there is no paralegal referred to that has professional qualification. Or at any rate, the cost judge can assume there is no yeah. qualification. Yes. Mm. Yeah. And that, my lord, I wasn't trying to reverse the interpretation of the rule by going backwards. But in revisiting the wording of the rule, having had our discussion, it, it does it does make sense that if you it, it, if you have to justify your status to claim the hourly rate that's next to that, that category. The, the two do go hand in hand. And you understand that the status is relevant yes. if you're charging because you've got that status which implies certain skills. Yes. Can I just ask you one final question on 511 and each such person yes. with page 61? Yes. I mean, you've helpfully told us and you're obviously right that solicitor two, in fact, is probably five people. H how do I know that those are each such per person within 511? Because, you know, I didn't know that there were five until you told me. Um, on, on, on this, on, on this uh, film, look, status bill, you, you don't, my lord, in the sense of it is um, the status of each employee and the hourly rate for each employee. But each such person suggests a level of individuality and specificity that I don't get from 61. Um, or am I wrong in that? Well, I'd say you're wrong. It's, it's the status of the legal representative's employee in respect of whom costs are claimed and the hourly rates claimed for each. So you can, if, if you have, um, take for example, grade D, the most clear example, 
if they're all of a certain level, they're, they're, that category is claiming that rate. Similarly, a solicitor up to four years call, those solicitors will be claiming the same hourly rate. It does, I think, depend on reading 5.11.2 as meaning the hourly rate claim for each category. My Lord, yes. It's, uh, they, they, are, they are together as their status and their hourly rates, indeed. Uh, yeah, I don't think my, my Lord was trying to help you in that <laughs> question, because it actually doesn't say hourly rate for each category, it says hourly rate for each such person. I, I followed that, but I am No, sorry. I just didn't want you not to answer. No, no, I, I was well aware of um, what was coming at me. <laughs> oh, <but> sorry. <laughs> in the nicest possible way, my Lord. But um, the point is here, in our special submission, is it's, it's the status that, that is important that justifies the hourly rates being claimed as to those employees. And we interpret the rule with that in mind, I think you're saying. Yes. And the rule wouldn't have bothered requiring all the individual names of everybody because nobody cares. It's the rates that those kinds of people can charge. It's the, yes, the status justifies the rate claimed. And the Lord should be well aware, hourly rates are there always and still are. And you could have said the hourly rates justified by that status rather than rates claimed for each such person. Those words you say are not meant to indicate anything about what's got to be set out. N not with shorthand, the, really referring back to the status. It's the status is the main is is, yeah. is the primary matter. Yeah. And it's the hourly rates following from such status for those employees. Yeah. That's what you say it means. My lord, you have my point. My Lord, um, thank you for uh, allowing me to develop my arguments uh, in direct uh, appraisal of the learned judge's um, judgments. Um, if the court is, if I can then go on and deal with that point. Yep. That, that is dealt with uh, paragraph 105 onwards. And having said that, the discussion we decision she made on the paper was very finely balanced. She states she has much less as if. Now, um, my Lord, she does set out paragraph 105 um, the purposes within the uh, practice direction at 5A2 of what is um, a, any spreadsheet format is meant to deliver. Now, our submission is that it does not require, well, first of all, there is no requirement for the name to be given in, 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 in paragraphs A to E. You can see what it talks about, and I suspect, my lord, from what you've said, you, you've had the opportunity to, to uh, fill it or, or categorise or examine a bill of costs as to, as to its purpose, uh, as to what can be achieved. In paragraph 106, though, the, the leadership says the last three lines, allows the user to identify the detail of the work in, undertaken in each phase in chronological order, must contain all calculations and reference formula in a transparent manner. And perhaps that's where the issue is, as to whether that detail and that transparency is uh, um, requiring the name to be given. I mean, as I understood the judge, she focused on three things in the end. One is C, allowing the user to identify the detail of all yes. the work undertaken. And then two in E is the requirement that it contain all calculations and reference formulae in a transparent manner. And those two we get reflected in paragraph 106. And later on, she also refers, echoing E again, to the requirement for full functionality. Those are three matters. Now, my Lord, what she does then do is, um, in the following uh, paragraph, paragraph 107, refer um, at, uh, to the um, keynote address of um, Sir Rupert Jackson in 2016. 
And I just state our position simply here, because my learned friend has authorities in which you yourself, my lord, have um, given judgments in referring back to the um, Lord Jackson, uh, Sir Rupert Jackson's report. I've also put in the uh, Master of Holes comments in BNM as to uh, what is. Can, can I just indicate this? The report on civil costs was in draft and final form in 2000, May and December 2009, I believe the date, so I'll be corrected if I'm wrong. These rules, or this practice direction, came into effect in April 2018. And in the interim, there was the keynote address from Sir Rupert Jackson in 2016, but there was also, began off as the Morgan Committee under Jeremy Morgan, Queen's Council, became the Hutton Committee under Alexander Hutton, Queen's Council, to work out how these bills should be prepared and drafted. And I, I am not saying to this court, you may not look at what was said uh, prior, but time had passed since his report. <coughs> And uh, we, in this court, at our invitation, um, has to look at sort of what the wording of, of the practice direction actually says. I mean, I wonder how much this matters in the sense that I was thought you can perfectly well accept what Sir Rupert Jackson says. I, I, I accept. Saying, well, it doesn't tell you the answer to these problems. It doesn't tell us the answer. And if there's a reference I can direct it to you, perhaps not taking up the court's time, it's um, in the... Uh, authorities bundle of the Supreme Court Office uh, guide, which uh, you will find at uh, tab 12, paragraph 199. Uh, I don't have tabs in my... Um... Ah, par it's, well, I, if I can take you to page uh, 244 in the bottom okay. right-hand corner... Yes, uh, and they deal with the Jackson report and President Day to paragraph 9.2, my lord. And I'm, I'm a, uh, that summary we were content with as to how, how we got here in the third paragraph under 9.2 talks about uh, Sir Rupert Jackson's uh, criteria for new bill format. Th this is the 2021 version of the current practice in the Supreme Court Cross Office. And over the page it refers to the Hutton Committee and the final paragraph, 9.2, this evolved through pilot schemes to become President F. So we, we have what we have now. I'm very sympathetic to the argument that you can't interpret the rules by reference to keynote speeches at conference, no matter how distinguished the giver of the speech is. But in reality, isn't the judge simply saying the purpose of the new rules is transparency and enabling the receiving party to know it? And we could have got that from the rules. And isn't she just treating Lord Douglas Jackson's speech as a shorthand description? She's put it in bold, transparent, informative, and so on. It doesn't actually help to work out what the rules mean. No, I, and, and I we don't... we got it from the rules themselves. This, this, it's, not, it's not a criticism of the learned judge. Yeah. Um, but if there seems to be an issue between the parties as to how much reliance can be placed on it, and I'm with your lordship, so the SCC review sums it up very well, but also emphasised the timescale of... Mm -hmm. uh, nine years, eight to nine years after he originally reported. And so, my lord, she does, I accept, in paragraph 105, she does refer to the practice direction itself in those uh, letters A to E. Now, my lord, no, nowhere in the practice direction itself, nor, but I'll be correct if I'm wrong, in the SCCO guide, does it state, uh, when is one dealing with the, the bill, and, and indeed, in the SCCO guide, it actually deals with part five, legal team and rates. Does it necessarily say you have to name the legal team member? Where, where it appears is there is a column in the President S that, that has that uh, as a column. You have LTM, LTM name, LTM status, LTM grade. In four rows going across. Mm. Without answering the legal question at the moment, why wouldn't you fill it in? Um, it, it, my lord, there can be many reasons for that. No, I, I'm asking you why you didn't fill it in. Well, I can do it, but um, on instructions, my lord, it's because there are there's a range of software that can be used for these matters. 
Uh, this bill, this bill has been had to be. The president had to be altered. The one they worked to, and we say, dealing with many of these bills over many years, as to their practice of dealing with it. And we say it does not deny the criticism you may have, my lord, but it doesn't deny what we say is the functionality of the bill. Can I just pick up one point? As I understand the judge, she doesn't actually say you have to give the name of the electronic bill. In paragraph 109, she complains you haven't given the name or initials. A fair point. Um, and maybe she has in mind there the model electronic bill which she quotes in paragraph 47. Um, back in paragraph 47 of the yes. judgment. Because there, in the LTM column, in every case, you find initials. Yes. But in the LTM name column, no name is given for the medical legal assistant. No, that's that's that is something that has been um, discussed amongst ourselves. That's correct. Um, so, to to that extent, e even in this precedent, you don't get a name. Um, and but the judge takes account of that by saying you have to have names or initials. Yeah. But. Uh, her criticism is that it is a constituent part of the detail that is required for um, functionality and transparency. In fact, she, she, uses the, she uses the other word, word in the other way. She says it becomes opaque in paragraph 109. Which echoes what she said in relation to the paper bill. It does. Yes. Uh, so, so here... Well, the, the practice direction takes you to precedent S, albeit it, it allows you to use something equivalent. Precedent S has a column for LTM and a column for LTM name, albeit that the model example doesn't always include the name. Why is it the judge right to say, well, one can perfectly well infer from that that you have to have either initials or a name? Simply because it's an precedent S. Is, is we say it's not an answer. It's, the test must be according to the practice direction as she sets out the paragraph 105. But it's precedent S or another format which does the following. If you've used precedent S, you've got to do precedent S. You can't say we've used precedent S, but we're using what would have been an adequate format. You have chosen precedent No, I'm sorry, my lord. Can I just take a second? I don't know. If, if I said that, I'm just taking They have this firm, um, you may know as well as they have they have adopted their own format of spreadsheet. They may well have looked at President S and taken certain elements from it, but they haven't it is, they have not simply lifted President S off. So they weren't completing a President S format then? No, they were completing a, any other spreadsheet format. And indeed, um, I referred earlier, and again it can be for your note, um, the, the witness statement of uh, Miss Whitaker um, in having to deal with, uh, it's in the supplementary bundle of page 186 onwards, but she describes having to amend her spreadsheet even further, uh, page 186, if you wish to look at it, it's, I can take you to it, in the supplementary bundle. Yeah. Bottom, I have it in the. Oh, it goes to the top of the right hand page on page 186. In particular, she descends into more detail, having dealt with introductory matters. She says in paragraph four, the bill of costs is now, or that the hybrid is part bill, That's part, paper. Yeah. Paper, part electronic. Yeah. Lord, yes. So where did she say I didn't, in fact, use precedent S, I used my own? Uh, she, well, she does. She talks about um, paragraph six, she refers to the cost management order, which is accounting for the budgeting cost. Paragraph seven, she says, I've repaired the bill of cost with additional parts which would enable the easy quantification of costs outside the budget. 
tab 6 and tab 11 of the electronic bill of costs shows show that separate parts were created to quantify and then she sets out four parts that she had to create on her spreadsheet. And then in paragraph 8 she refers to creating additional phases within the bill of costs to um, be applicable to this particular bill she's preparing. Primarily a lot of the work was because of the cost management order. But doesn't precedent S allow for phases? For phases. Uh, it allows a certain phase. But she was said she had to create additional phases because what she had to show was costs that were within the cost budget, costs without the cost budget. So she was uh, adding material to it, so one could readily see where they exceeded the budget. For example, I mean, I, I quite see that, but that must be a routine feature wherever you use precedent S, mustn't it? Because with cost budgeting, you're going to have that problem all the time. She was using her spreadsheet that she was then uh, developing even further. And just to understand. I don't know if it matters, but just so, under, so I understand, the, your bill looks awfully like precedent test. So why isn't it precedent test? Uh, because they've developed their own, their own spreadsheet. Um, so how can we tell the difference between that spreadsheet and precedent S? Well, one that Lord Jesse Dingman would immediately say is it hasn't got a column with the names. But it has but got a column, hasn't it? It just hasn't been filled in. Yeah. Filled in. But the fact of the matter is that the um, they have, I'm going to use the awful word corrupted, they have actually modified it for their own particular purposes. But did it have a column or did it not? For, for name? Yes. Well, why didn't they fill that in? They've, if they've, well, if they've they taken their own, they've modified the President S. This is President Super S or Dr. S, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. But They've obviously thought that there should be a name, otherwise they wouldn't have included that. Well, no, my lord, what they, they have filled it in. It's not blank. They have filled it in, but they've filled it in with the category of the Yes, theme. they have filled it in with the name. Not the name, no. But the heading says name, doesn't it? At the top of the column. Yes. Just, just to add to the <laughs> slight ironies, how I found your precedent S, how I find your bill... Fresh how I how, how I found your bill was by going on to see filing uh, and... Uh, on CE filing, which obviously you don't have access to, it no. has all the things that have been logged. And one of them says, press to desk to to, to, uh, as an annex to the supplemental bundle or something. Um, so I went on that and I saw your bill, but it's described. Right. That was there. actually our bill, because I know we were filing also the draft president. If it was, my lord, so it was, if that's what somebody did title it. Yeah. So you you would, wouldn't have had to give the name if you'd never even use the spreadsheet, but because you... It's bizarre. Surely it can't differ, um, can it, as to whether you give the name by whether you use precedent S and do nothing to it, or whether you use precedent S but you add other columns as well to give further information. Surely it can't be compliant with the rules in the latter case, but not the former case. Well, no, or, or, or the, there's a third option, which is my case, is you don't have to give the name in any event. Just because... Well, so is there a column for it in President S? Then didn't the author of President S expect you to give a name? Well, my, my lord, that's the state of the base. Can you give me one moment? Yeah. I'm being whispered at from behind. Oh, Five of the bill is based upon President S that has there, but other parts are not apparent. And what was filed yesterday was uh, I'm not even going to yesterday. It's going to confuse your lordships. But I come back to the issue between uh, the parties and the lord is that one can use under the practice direction whatever spreadsheet you like as long as it fills those five criteria of A to E. And I do see that. Uh, and I'm not sure this point matters at all, but I, I, quite, I followed that Worksheet 5, which is to be found in President S, is also to be found in your bill. But are not all the other worksheets also to be found in your bill? For example, Worksheet 14, where you get all the details. 
I, I understand. Can, may I take yes. this action? There are large similarities to President Ness, <laughs> but there are. If it walks like a president death. If it quacks like a president, president death. Even the president death. Sorry. It's 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 perhaps being a master of one's own um, uh, spreadsheets uh, it creates more confusion than not. Um, the question, really, question is whether it matters. If, if even if there is a column for names, to whether that affects the transparency, the functionality, the detail. That that must be the test that I have to help the court with. I follow that. There, the model. Precedent S doesn't always include the name, but the judge has taken account of that by saying you have to have name or initials, as so I understand it. Name or initial. Yeah. You yeah. say you don't need either if it's not a precedent S, or if it's a document that is precedent S, but has been modified in at least some part. Well, my Lord, I, I, yes, and I, if I meet your point head on, mm. even though there may be a column that says uh, LTM this, LTM that, LTM the other, it doesn't mean that you have to fill necessarily those in. You have the point against me, but it says name at the top. Mm. But they have they have a, proceeded as they proceeded with the paper bill as to uh, category status of category, mm. category status. Yeah. And, and you specifically take issue with the judge. She thinks you need names or initials, and you say you don't need names or initials. It's good enough to give categories. My lord, that's right. And that's because you're not bound by what's in precedent S. It's good enough if you provide A to E um, detail functionality. That's right. Either. Now, the, the reason we put our examples into this court, uh, you've been good enough to indicate you uh, put into your Excel spreadsheet, was we say the functionality uh, is not such that it renders the bill in, in breach of these rules. Now, I, I take the point, and one of our examples we gave is you may have two uh, BNs of a certain grade uh, doing the same work on the same day. Uh, but the real question for the court is, is that, on this particular bill, is that um, such as to render it in, in breach of the practice direction, so as to have to be redrawn? Because if, if I may remind the court, a witness statement was filed by Mr. Dean from Keogh's, um, who dealt with these bills many times before, with many, many criticisms. They were answered by Miss Whitaker. Um, and that's in, that's in the, the witness statement evidence. There were suggestions of there are empty boxes. So Miss Whitaker, in her um, precise but short witness statement, deals with all those criticisms. He's just he got it wrong. And uh, so we have gone, this case has evolved where it has narrowed to, is it, is it really a question of initials and name on a spreadsheet that will um, undermine the transparency and the detail uh, and the functionality, to use those three words, uh, of the spreadsheet? And when we say no... Um, I mean, I do wonder again whether two things are being wrapped up there. One is, are you required to give the names string additions? Um, two is, even if you are required to give them, where you don't give them, what, what's the consequence? Well, that's fair. Uh, you, you say you're not required to give names or initials. Um, but I think in what you were saying just now, you weren't so much saying that. You were saying, well, even if we are required to give names or initials, it doesn't matter. That's right. And I think the reason, um, well, I know the reason one's putting it on that basis is when the f paragraph... 5A refers to or other such spreadsheet that performs these functions. So that is that's the reason I take that secondary position. That you have our first position correct. There's no practice direction save for the column in present S that we have to provide the names or initials. But even then, it, it, is it does it perform the functions it's intended to perform? We say yes. C can I then ask at this stage the, the question about duplication, which yes. from the very limited experience I had of, of costs seemed to be what everyone was arguing about, and, and it is an easy point to take. And of course, you rightly identify that I can say, well, query duplication, because there are two category four people 
working on the same day. I don't know that too. I just know category four people duplication. Yes. Um, why, why, why not just give the names and who's doing what when? Um, because that then avoids me wasting your time by raising a, a, um, a question about it and you having to answer it as well as wasting my own. Well, my Lord, and also, if I may be supposed to say, it may not necessarily avoid that issue because if you have two, uh, grade, uh, grade um, uh, C Fiona doing three hours on doctor called uh, AB, and you have a great C fiona document called CD, you, <laughs> the point of du duplication will still be raised. It, it's, not, it's not necessarily be all and end all to, um, by providing the initials, that you're going to avoid what y you recall my lord in practice as, as a point that's often taken about duplication. Mm. So it doesn't it put you on notice. You've got uh, AB, person AB, dealing with a letter out on Monday the 1st, and another one, CD, dealing with what seems to be the same letter out on Tuesday the 2nd, doesn't that contribute towards transparency, and doesn't it prevent functionality if you can't tell it's not the same person who's carrying on the work, but somebody who's probably gone back to scratch? But my lord, well, my lord, the same point would arise, because if, if, if it's the same person who does it on the Monday and on the Tuesday, that raises the point of duplication as much as if it's one person but, on the Monday. Or it can be a complicated letter that she starts on one day and finishes off the next day. There are different scenarios, but doesn't it help functionality, or doesn't it defeat functionality, and doesn't it undermine transparency if you can't know immediately? Well, hang on a moment. Why are two different people working on uh, co uh, sequential days, dealing with the same letter. My Lord, with respect, I think you put the test absolutely right, whether it undermines or defeats, putting mm. it th that way. Uh, and, and we say no, because you have, you have the work done, the detail of the work done, and it does not affect the... Um, the work would have been done in two hours, or three hours, if person A, B had gone back and done it on the 2nd of May. She'd have in her mind everything she did the day before, so she would only have taken one hour on the 2nd of May. But because somebody else has started from scratch, they've taken longer. That's it, and therefore they've charged more, isn't it? And doesn't it help transparency? Well, that, 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 that would be my, my position. Rather than undermining, uh, undermining the transparency, it it, it, the whether it helps more is another matter. Mm. Whether we're in breach of the rules, we say no. And, and that, my lord, I'm very grateful for you to... Uh, um, characterising the test in that way because it's quite important for this group. So in the transparency, I mean, does not undermine transparency, you see? Yeah. Yes, or functionality. Or functionality. Well, I wonder in a way whether it's actually functionality that we're concerned with rather than transparency in the sense that if you go back to the rule, um, 48. 48, paragraph 48, as Lord Justice Lewis said, um, the transparent bit is, contains all calculations and reference formulae in a transparent manner. And I'm not sure there's any particular complaint about the reference formulae not being transparent. It's the functionality that's said to be Well, the function. Well, you yourself have used the, the spreadsheet, my lord. We would say the functionality is not deficient. Uh, and then that's that, that's a question of what what functionality means. I mean, yes, in one of sense, I mean, you can perfectly well work the spreadsheet, but it won't give you quite as much information as it would give you if everything were individualised. Right. But we we say this. It's it's it's. One could not stop, actually. I mean, one could go even further all the time as to how these spreadsheets were created and who was, what people were using in the early days as well. The question, I suppose, for the core must be, is it satisfactory? Not, could it be better? And well, in this case, um, we say it is satisfactory, obviously, and that's why we're here appealing. If the court has other views as to how the profession could go forward, then that, that's a separate matter. So that's names or initials? Yes. And then the other issue that the judge highlights is she says, well, you have to give grades, as I understand it. 
Sorry, I missed that last bit. Uh, as I understand it, the judge's other complaint is that grades should have been given and they weren't. Yes, um, and this is uh, uh, this comes back to um, the, the point uh, my Lord Lord Justice Lewis was uh, dealing with me. If they're given afterwards, is that sufficient, or should they actually be given on the bill? Mm -hmm. Again, by working as to what a legal team member is. Um, we, 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 we don't accept that um, necessarily under this we have to give the, the SCCO grade. If asked for... Well, do you have to give A grade is the first question. And if you had to give A grade, did you give any information, however you describe it, which constituted the giving of a grade? Uh, with regards to a grade or the experience, uh, yes, it comes on the first bill where those grades are identified. So in column one, where you have uh, LTM legal team member period D solic S1 solicitor one, and this is that's why as it pains my lord at the beginning of uh, my uh, submissions to you to say this is one bill exactly yes so we look at page sixty one and that's not just part of the paper bill that's the grades throughout for the purpose of the electronic bill as well this is what you say satisfies the grade requirement. Okay. So, just pausing there, just as with the paper bills you accepted that you have to give status by way of qualification or uh, qualification and, and experience unless you're down at the bottom level, yeah. um, you would accept that in relation to electronic bills the same sort of information has to be provided. Yes, and, and easily explain, my lord, that in addition to points being taken on duplication, one of the mainstay of a bill of costs is the status of a fee and, uh, and the rate they're charging. It has to be. Um, so, specifically, suppose you give, as you did, for solicitor to the information that there's over, that the person is a solicitor and they have over four years' experience. Um, let me just remind myself what the SCCO grades are. Uh, they're set out by the judge. They are. Um, uh, paragraph 60. So if we compare grade B with what you've got at page 61, we can see that the person is a solicitor and we can see uh, that they have four years post-qualification experience, but we can't see whether or not they have four years litigation experience. From the um, original recital. Um, so if you are required to give grade or the same information as grade, what would be missing would be the fact that the person had four years litigation experience. going to say something then, my lord, but I... It's, sorry, is, is that fair? So if the judge is right that you have to give grade, I dare say you can comply with that requirement if you set out solicitor with over four years post-qualification experience, including at least four years litigation experience. Yeah. You don't necessarily have to put in the letter B. But uh, on the other hand, simply stating solicitor with four years experience doesn't tell you whether it's four years litigation experience. No, it gives the status, not the SCCO grade, if yeah. that is found by this court to be required. I thought you had to give a grade, information which can be described as a grade. And I thought for the electronic bills, we had agreed that that meant 
uh, experience, post qualification and litigation experience, uh, as part of the grade. And you haven't given the litigation no, experience the person, as part of the grade. The person S has a column for the grade. Yeah. But we have we have uh, adapted that to the person S or whatever spreadsheet it may be to give the status. But we're not we don't accept within the within the practice direction there's a necessity to give to give the grade. Those grades followed afterwards, following the points of dispute where we provided them, which I accept the Lordship's point as to interpretation of the practice direction, but that came afterwards. So if you don't use precedent S and you use a modified or entirely bespoke precedent, you don't have to give the grades at all. That's correct. And um, I'm going to take that one stage further. Bear with me, will you, my lord? <laughs> if you use that type of part five precedent S, and it may have a column that has a grade at the top, we, d we don't accept you have to give that grade. It may be, in certain people's eyes, uh, may make it better if you do, but we say it's not in breach of the practice direction if it fulfills A to D in other ways. And so no grades required. If you're wrong on that, if you do require a grade, that is information which amounts to the giving of a grade. Does it require the giving of litigation experience? I'm sorry, not with you. The, if you gave a grade... It, if you're wrong, you, yeah. and if you do have to give a grade, yes. that is information which constitutes a grade. Yes. Would that have to involve a means of identifying the litigation under the, Under A to E in the grades, that, that has the... the Lord, the Lord, um, you just read out, yes, that would include the post qualification experience. Yeah, that's why I've said not the SCCO grade, because you may not have to give the grade. That's why I keep saying oh, very carefully information which pardon. constitutes a grade. Yes. Would that include information which had to identify litigation experience? There's nothing that says we have to provide that, my lord, no. No, no, that's why I'm saying if it's a hypothesis, Mr. Brown. Bear with me. Very familiar with hypotheses in law. If you are wrong, mm. and if information constituting a grade has to be provided, would that information include information about litigation experience? Yes, because I'll be quite no. frank, the, when one talks about grades, as indeed her ladyship did below, we're talking about status or status grade, and one gravitates towards the SCCO grade. Yep. Sorry it took so long, my lord. So if you're wrong, and if it's got to include something amounting to a grade, you haven't given it. That's right. Yeah. But again, it's the same point as on the name. Yeah. My lord, um, I think that um, covers the two matters that uh, the ladyship raised in the court below as to once she dealt with the paper field, it's quite fast track for her to go on to the um, uh, dismissing the uh, electronic bill. Um, yes, I'm not sure how much further I can assist the court on that, save for two matters. First of all, will the court just allow me to turn my back on you in case there's any other matter? And then there's one other matter I must deal with. There's nothing more by way of submission. There is one extant matter, which is we filed an application with the producing of a document. Uh, we're proceeding on the basis of... The, the, you, that is to put in the new bill, isn't it? Oh, uh, no, the new bill's oh, in. Sorry. The new bill is in. Our application was to put in the points of reply to that new bill. Oh. Actually, um, I've been given uh, carte blanche by those who instruct me to make my own decision on that application. In the way that the exchanges have gone, Neither the new bill nor necessarily the point of reply or point of dispute with the new bill are necessarily going to assist this court with the interpretation of what the president no. should be, or certainly the practice direction. But you're happy for us to look at it to Bene SA and decide on that basis? So, do, can I just understand um, what you're asking for on this appeal? Uh, the uh, there were several points before the judge, including the certification point. 
Uh, you don't quarrel with her conclusions on the certification point. Correct. Um, she said that having regard to the three points, uh, your existing bill needed to go and you needed to file a new one. Yes. Um, do you quarrel with that? We have filed a new one, so it's... it's yes. uh, so what relief do you say would flow were we with you on the appeal? Um, the relief will be because if we can go to her order... Um, Page. Uh, I've my notes, my lord. Um, Sorry. This poor bundle. As the, uh, the new bill has been served, new points of dispute and points reply, or certainly points of dispute, uh, have been filed. But it is a. Um, it Could you query paragraph three? You, this is just Jane's order. Given that you didn't sign the bill. Uh, no, because that is a remedy um, that I, I'll be corrected by Miss Margaret. I'm wrong. But the signing of the bill was it was as so often has it been signed Swiggle Partner and it should state a name. Yeah. That that and indeed it happened since this judgment. Comply with the requirement to give a name. Though. That would have been rectified over immediately. Yeah. Never mind what might have happened. You didn't comply with the bill. She therefore struck it out. So is paragraph three right or wrong? Uh, my lord, I not the striking out of the bill simply, can I just remind myself, simply with regards to the certificate, as I recall, was agreed by the advocates, was a matter that could be, not necessarily a matter of strikeout, that could be dealt with by rectification, but I'll be corrected if I'm wrong when it's marvel. In the sense of that alone would not strike out the bill, it would be a miscertification of the bill, and the bill would have to be certified correctly. So, if, if, if that is right, then you say that if you win on your grounds of appeal, then paragraph three would have been wrong because the non-certification of itself wouldn't have justified striking out. You have a point, my lord, yes. Yeah. But on the other hand, as you also say, a new bill has been put in and the parties have pleaded to it. Um, so presumably there's no point in going back to the old one. No, I don't know. No, um, it's, not, it's not our position that we go back to square one. Our position is that that was, um, particularly for the uh, number of bills that we, those who instruct me, um, produce in, in their own way, um, it's quite important for them. I, that I, I, mean, I follow that. So, so this is an important point for your instructing solicitors. Yes. Um, in terms of what we would do, what would we do were we with you on the appeal? Uh, you would... would uh, allow the appeal to the extent that paragraph 3 was wrong if it was struck out for failure to comply with the practice directions on paper bills and electronic bills. However, uh, there then may well be costs, arguments and consequences in writing, if that was the case, but um, I, unless I'm tugged violently from behind, this, this, this matter would proceed on the... Um, Almost a declaration... Uh, allow the appeal and grant a declaration that oh, yes. paragraph three shouldn't have been made. Yes. And then people can make su supplementary submissions on costs. Yes, we're not going back to the beginning. We're not reinventing the wheel on this. It's just being difficult again. Say we were against you on one bit, but we're totally persuaded yeah. on another bit. Say we think, yes, you're absolutely right on name or initials yeah. or electronic bills, but you're wrong on grade, and you still wouldn't have complied. You've got to win all of it, haven't you, to show that three was wrong? Yes. Well, also, it has occurred to me, my lord, um, paper and electronic might be different. Yes. You have point. one <laughs> bill, as you keep telling us, and you've got to have one no, bill. I'm happy to tell you that. Because because yes, because you need those bits to get home on the electronic It's no bill. secret one discusses these matters once junior as to what if they are with me on the paper bill and not on the electronic bill. Yeah. Um, absolutely. But then you can have, because, as you yourself made, my lord, the point made, although I'm calling it a strike out, it's actually that document, that pleading's being struck out and a new pleading has to be put in its place. 
It therefore can be partial in the sense of you could have a counterclaim that should be properly pleaded, but the original claim or the original defence stands, for example. So, um, so, so, so it would be potentially one would say that paragraph three should be modified uh, in terms of what you, uh, as to the extent of the non compliance of the civil procedure. But you could um, modify four, couldn't you? To say it's a, a new bit of the bill of costs dealing with the paper bit. <laughs> well, I, I think rather than word bit, my lord, I'd have a bill leading a bill of for work done prior to the sixth of oh, April two thousand eighteen. Mm -hmm. But yes, um, that 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 is possible, and that's the other reason that we, not to dismiss this paper bill as it's just a little bit of paper before we get to three hundred thirty thousand pounds worth of costs. Mm -hmm. on that. About a third of it. Mm -hmm. But the, the, the actual truth is that these points matter to those instructing you for all sorts of other cases rather than for this one. And matter, and, and matter of course, as um, the suggested schools have said, giving leave, uh, there are conflicting decisions. And uh, if, there is, if it's able, this court is able to give guidance, and I speak slightly different hat on here, then that would no doubt be beneficial. Yeah. Unless I exist further at this point. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Brown. Uh, Mr. Marwood. Uh, my Lord, yes, just on that last point, it's probably discussed, I'm going to call it a housekeeping point first. Um, but you're, firstly, your Lordship is right, of course, the reason we are here, and explicitly the reason that the appellants have permission is because of the point of general importance. I did have a go at getting this appeal <laughs> refused on the basis of being kind of academic, but I, I failed in resisting on my resisting permission document. But as to the right thing to do, I've just gone back and checked our application, and it was broadly that the bill be struck out. Uh, and as my Lord Justice Lewis says, this is always not depriving them of their costs, but making them go away and comply. Um, uh, we didn't distinguish between the various breaches. Uh, I mean, it is ultimately a matter for your Lordships, but I, I would submit paragraph three of Mrs. Justice Stane's order is right simply for the uh, point she decided that hasn't been pursued on this appeal about the certification. I entirely accept, and that we, this may be a semantic point, that the re, if, I, if I had only one on that point, then the new bill would have been the same as the old bill, except it would have had a certificate. But it, it's, like, if, it's like a pleading without a statement of truth. It, it, it's apt to be struck out, um, I, 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 even though a compliant statement won't require, as it did on the basis of her ladyship's entire ruling, that the entire bill to re be redrafted. But I do say, for what it's worth, in paragraph three is There's a right. requirement in the rules of the practice direction that there be a certificate then, is it? Yes. Which oh, yes. rule is it? It's, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have that to hand because it's not being appealed. It's, um, uh, <coughs> sorry, let me just find it in her latest. It must be the judgment. judgment. It is in the judgment. Uh, it, it is, uh, it's practice direction 5.21. Uh, and the, the best place to find it is on page 66 of the core bundle which is uh, her ladyship cites, recites the provisions of paragraphs 12 and 13. Yes. Absolutely, the certification is required, and the argument was simply whether the requirement on its true construction frankly permitted an anonymized, and I'll use the word anonymized in, in a sense directly relevant to this bill, an anonymized squiggle that everyone agreed did not allow the maker of the squiggle to be identified. Right, so there's not a sort of separate category of legal error called certification, which is dealt with by having a proper certification. A proper certification is part of the requirements it's under part the rules. of the requirements under the CPR and the practice direction. Yes. So you say that paragraph three is right because right, there is a failure to comply it. with the civil procedure rules and failure yes. to include a proper certification. And for what it's worth, and again, I, I would only spend a moment on this because it's not the, the underlying point's not controversial. It's emphasised that the certification of the bill is a very important thing because an officer of the court effectively confirms from their own knowledge that the bill does not exceed what the client's liable to pay. And the paying party takes the word of the receiving party solicitor for that, unless it can raise a genuine issue. And unless a genuine issue is raised, I'm sure uh, the, the court's assessor will confirm either by the paying party or from the cost judge having a concern when he looks at the file. It goes no further. There's no, requir there's no requirement. The whole point of the certification is it creates a presumption, and there's no requirement to prove the client's liability to the solicitor. So, although it would, it's a short point to rectify, it, it, it's an important point. But it is a requirement under the rules Absolutely. of a valid bill yes. or a good bill. Yes. Okay. Can, can I, can I ask 
take you off on a tangent for a moment longer. My lord, of course. Um, CPR 47.6 says that detailed assessment proceedings are commenced by the receiving party serving notice of commencement, and then it says a copy of or co a copy or copies of the bill of costs as required by practice direction 47. Yes. So commencement requires, among other things, service of the bill of costs as required by practice direction. That must comply with the practice direction. Um, uh, now suppose that. Uh, you were right in everything you say about what practice direction 47 requires uh, but that in respect of a solicitor a name had been omitted otherwise the bill was absolutely fine um, uh, I don't suppose you would suggest that in those circumstances it was right to strike out the whole bill no. even on the basis that a new one could be put in um, so what, what approach does the court take or does the cost judge take uh, where there is a deficiency in a bill, but it's not a root and branch deficiency. Well, and um, broadly, uh, it, at, perhaps at the court's request or at the request of the paying party, it would be required to be put right. I accept. So I, I, I wouldn't say that the notice of commencement was therefore a nullity. There was an irregularity, but that didn't make the step a nullity. Would be my position on how the rule yeah. works. And indeed, we didn't suggest below that the notice of commencement, in some legal sense, didn't exist. Um, we, we simply said that the compliance needs to be uh, provided. Um, so I would say that it would be a breach, and it's a breach that could be put right by a less severe sanction. And the sanction here is substance, if sanction is the right word, was not disallowance of the cost. It was requiring a compliant bill to be redrawn. That wouldn't be required in every case. And in practice, if it was a minor breach, one would probably get through it without too much difficulty uh, in points of dispute replies and possibly on the day of the hearing. The objection here is really that if, I, if I'm right in what I say, as the judge below found, there was no way of providing us as the paying party with that which we were entitled, other than having the bill redrawn. Because if it, uh, when it comes down to it, whatever's said about descriptions of grade, if we're entitled to know who did which piece of work, that can only ever be achieved by a redrawing of the bill. I'm sorry, I've, I've come off the tangent no, of back no, to the appeal. That's, that's but, helpful, but, thank uh, you. Um, So the, the, the important point today, um, not, merely, not, not least because it's academic in this case, is what the rule means. And I do broadly, therefore, say that arguments about whether it was put right by the points of dispute, uh, whether, it was, whether we could work the information out and therefore striking out was too severe a sanction, those really are water under the bridge. I mean, whatever the position was before, once this court states definitively what is required, a cost judge would be entitled to be entirely unsympathetic to a receiving party who did not comply. But for what it's worth, I, I, broadly I make two points. All these arguments about where well, we could have worked it out by piecing it together, they, they are like a boomerang that comes back and hits the appellant on the back of the head because the obvious response is, why should the paying party have to work it out when you can just tell them? Uh, and that's, that is relevant to the construction of the rules because although, of course, uh, the, the, quest, the, the, the question, that, and this is about the construction of the rules, um, it begs the question, what is the proper meaning of the rules? But in deciding what the proper meaning is, no doubt the court will have in mind what is sensible and what is reasonable, and what's desirable and what's undesirable. And one thing, incidentally, that's very undesirable is to say to a paying party, well, you can always ask the question, or you can always put it in your points of dispute. Apart from the obvious points that that's apt to deter settlement, it's apt to prolong the process, the paying party has 21 days after the bill to put in points of dispute. In the absence of an ordered or agreed extension, the receiving party then gets a default cost certificate, just like a default judgment. So there's not really time to ask a lot of questions. The questions will come in the points of dispute. Uh, there's really not time to have questions, answers, then points of dispute. Uh, and frankly, it's safe to assume that the receiving party that doesn't volunteer this information isn't going to be terribly helpful. So you will get a longer, more diffuse document, or points will be missed. Uh, and so that, 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 that points to how one should construe the rule. One should construe the rules as giving the receiving party the detail which allows it to make, and the clue is in the name, detailed, it just is a detailed assessment. Um, sometimes the objections are detailed, and the rules should be construed in a way that facilitates rather than thwarts that. 
So the first answer to this, where you can work it out, is, well, that actually demonstrates why you should just have said it in the bill. The second answer for what it is worth is I don't accept that we could work it out. I'm not really going to uh, address my learned friend's examples document uh, be because of what I say the important point is, but you know, it's, it, it bears mentioning, this is the third time this point has been argued, and relatively shortly before this hearing, we're told in a new document where you could have worked it all out. And broadly, I don't accept that because it doesn't deal with all the 33 fearless that we now know are in the original bill. We only knew that because of the answer to our request for further information. Uh, and secondly, just by way of example, um, let me go, and your lordships have seen this before, to page 61 of the supplementary bundle, but I can make the same point by reference to the electronic, the, the second part of the bill. Uh, and it said, well, we can work some of the things out from that. I mean, th there are broad, apart from anonymization, and I'll come back to that as a separate point, it's not just that the description of experience, there are two points here. One is it doesn't say what litigation experience is. But the other point, and I just wanted to draw this out as well, is it doesn't say whether it's post or pre-qualification experience. And both those aspects find their place in the SCCO grade definitions. There are two aspects to this. One is it litigation experience, and two is it post-qualification experience. Can I just go back to the definitions? So that was... That's page 61. Yes. So if we take, say, solicitor two... Solicitor two. Where we're told solicitor two with over four years' experience. So we don't know if it's litigation, we don't know if it's pre- or post-qualification. Yes, I see. And just one, one further point on this page, about two-thirds of the way down, period C partner. Now, as my learned friend says, a partner doesn't actually these days have to be a solicitor at all, but it certainly doesn't have to be, although I dare say most are, it certainly doesn't have to be a grade A solicitor. You can be a partner in a firm without eight years post-qualification litigation experience. It's certainly not unheard of for people to be made partners or called partners. Uh, before they reach that status. So in respect of a period C partner, it, does, it doesn't answer any of those points. And as to the grouping, and I'll come back to this, um, it's not, I just want to emphasize, it's not just, I mean, if one is answering what the rules mean, uh, I will come on to develop this submission with reference to uh, what I acknowledge is the appellant's best point, which is the precedent A, other fearless on the paper bill. I say it doesn't get them very far, but I do acknowledge that's the, their best point. But the rules don't actually give any basis for construction on the basis that different approaches apply to different levels of seniority. So really, to have the respect for my position is that that has to be grasped. Uh, the, the rules don't can't sensibly be construed as saying you need one level of detail for the senior workers and a, le and a lesser level of detail for the junior workers. Is, is that really right? Um, well, it may help me if it's not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, in this sense, that um, there's a base level of, of charging rate. Yes. Um, and if you want to get above that base level, then uh, it's important to look at whether there's a status justifying more than the minimum. But if you're only dealing with the base level, well, why do you need any more uh, detailed information as to whether a person is a paralegal and how long they've been working and so on and so forth? I, I, my Lord, I entirely accept that point. I just take it to a slightly different conclusion. If, if the only failure to know, and the conclusion I would take it to is this, and this is really, I suspect, what's behind, uh, in a sense, it's Homer nodding, the press today point. Um, if the only failure to give a name, and my submission is that it is a failure, is in respect of grade D fearless who have been doing highly supervised work, and I don't mean this rudely, like photocopying or in the olden days when it was done by hand paginating bundles, that sort of thing. So there's no real issue about needing to know who they are. There's no real issue about whether there's overlap because they are so heavily supervised tasks that they're not bringing with them any knowledge of the supervised and delegated tasks. Then it's a, it's a less important breach. And my, my position is that it's a breach, but it's less important that of itself, it, it is the kind of thing that, that may be nodded at and the bill isn't going to be required to be with, redrawn because you've grouped the trainees together. I do say strictly it's a breach, 
but it, it may be a less important breach in practice. Not just because, but not just because they are more junior, but because it is it really isn't ne so necessary or so important to, to analyse whether it's one person or two people doing the same thing, because each task is dis in practice discreetly delegated and isn't really important with it. Uh, any prior knowledge of the case. It, it's routine, almost administrative. But I would say it's a breach. But, but I accept your point that really, that it may be that in this narrow respect, you can say, well, the receiving parties, it's just going to be its own worst enemy. Because if they don't say any more, then in practice, they're just going to be allowed the lowest rate. And that's part of the answer to the point. But especially as one goes up, it's not, it's, it can't be the whole answer, because you're not just going to be looking at, you're going to be looking at duplication, as my Lord said. Is this two, uh, two Fianas looking at the same letter, or is it the same Fiona looking at it on different days? They may, that might precipitate different challenges. I mean, I suspect I should just let you develop your submissions, but just staying on this point, there, the judge identified two flaws. One was absence of a name, and the other was uh, insufficient information about status. Yes. Now, the absence of a name goes to your duplication type point. Yes. Uh, but if you're think simply thinking about the status point, it's a bit hard to see why you need any more information about status. Well, once it's, I mean, I, I, I accept that. If it's said or if, if nothing is said, and the cost judge will say, well, I'm going to assume this is grade D. That, that's, to a large extent, an answer. It's not, it's not in my submission, absolutely completely an answer. Because what, in, and maybe the, the, the court's assessor will, will ha have a view or experience mm -hmm. on this. You know, what in practice can happen is you turn up to the detailed assessment and the receiving party will say, actually, I know I haven't said anything, but I can tell you on instructions this person was grade B and I ought to have the rate. And they might, the, the rate was relevant for grade B or grade C uh, because I can justify this task being done by a grade C. Now, a cost judge may not be very pleased, but it would be going too far to say that if the cost, I mean, if the cost judge is satisfied that the paying party has a fair opportunity to respond, the, the, the receiving party might get away with doing it that way. But that sort of doesn't bear on this question of whether the bill itself has to give uh, qualifications and experience in relation to grade D type people. Uh, no, because it would be an indulgence of the cost judge to allow you... No, I, I accept that. If, if, you, if, if someone is said to be grade D, that they're going to get the lowest rate. Or so, or some, so something that draws from which that inference is drawn, I would accept that. So, I mean, and also I, I could make the same point with reference to the replies. They don't, I, my learned friend referred to this today. I mean, even at a cursory glance, given there are 33 Fianas, the replies certainly don't give the grade for each, the, the SCCO grade, or, or even to say anything for the majority of those Fianas. But, but really, um, that is of secondary importance um, to, to the purpose of this appeal which is to answer the question, what do the rules require? And I, I won't, won't spend long on this because it's in my skeleton argument. Really, on the paper bill, there may only be one point between my learner friend and I now, uh, which is uh, whether names are required. Uh, and I say one gets that from the wording. Uh, and it's a tab one, page 12, page 12 of the authorities bundle of practice direction. 511.2, the requirement in my submission only makes sense if the name of each employee or person is provided, otherwise there's no statement of status for that person. Uh, and I'd respectfully ad adopt the point my Lord, Lord Justice Lewis uh, made in argument, that, that although I, at one point the judge does use the word implied, this isn't the judge reading something in that isn't there. This is the judge saying, okay, it doesn't spell this out explicitly, uh, but construing the practice direction as a whole, this is how uh, and only how it can make sense. So it's not reading in a new requirement that isn't in the practice direction. It's an exercise of construction without reference to any, it's not an extraneous implied term, it's an exercise of construction without needing reference to any extraneous material. And I say that the judge was right for the reasons she gave. Now, can I just test that on a couple of points? Um, in relation to electronic bills, as I understand it, the judge did not say you had to give the name. She said you had to give the name or initials. Um, that would be good enough for 5.11.2 as well? Um, 
I am going to come on respectfully. Perhaps I should come to this now. I, I'm going to say she did require, require the name. name. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, the, these, would it be helpful if I jump to that? I can jump to that. Can we just focus on paper bills for a moment? The uh, on one view, 5.11.2 points to a need to individualise an entry. But it doesn't itself necessarily require the name or indeed the initials of the person. It's enough that you can see that it is this person who is being charged. It doesn't... Well, I, I mean, I say it's inherent in the construction. It doesn't say I, I, it doesn't say you've got to give the name, but where, where you say you've got to give the statement for each employee, I suggest on a, a sensible construction that means you've got to name the employee. Why can't you what, just say solicitor A? Well, you you could, but um, that 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 in my submission doesn't reflect the natural meaning when you talk about each employee or each person. If, I, if I, I would respect my submission is, if I say I want a, a list of the status for each person involved in this case, um, you would have two columns. You would have person on the left-hand column and status on the right-hand column. And person, I would suggest, means, means a named person as a natural construction of the word. Which takes one, <laughs> as I know you know, to precedent A, quoted by the judge in paragraph 52, where you certainly don't find such columns. Um, you find partner, assistant, solicitor, other fee earners. Yes, I mean, it's, it, it looks like a small, uh, a, a, a small case. It, the, the, and the suggestion is, that there's, apart from the other fee earners at the bottom, I would say the suggestion is, and indeed it's explicit with, when it says most of the work was done, let me just turn up the judgment, uh, by one fee earner. Uh, Paragraph 52. 52, I'm grateful. Um, by an assistant solicitor admitted in 2008. It's a strong suggestion you're just talking about one assistant solicitor. And it may be that when the precedent was drafted, the, the assumption was everyone would know who that assistant solicitor was because there was one of them, their reference would have been on the note paper, etc. Plus the fact that bills only get delivered once you've had um, contested litigation. Indeed. Indeed. So you know who your opponent is, especially on a small case like this. And, and it, it looks like a bill for a small for a small case. At the very least, it's possible, and we just don't know that the President A might just have had in mind one partner yes. or, and one assistant solicitor, and that seems to be the case with the assistant solicitor. And it doesn't appear to be dealing with the kind of situation here of categories of solicitors. But the problem is, other fee earners can no, well, use I, a category. I accept that that is a category, and I. I do say, I mean, I respectfully ad adopt the, the judge's reasoning that it's not sufficient. It's not sufficient to outweigh the contrary indicators by, firstly, what's sensible and by by the construction of the rule. But I, I do accept, and I, I acknowledge that uh, you know this is uh, this is. I, well, I not acknowledge. I assert that it's the appellant's best point uh, in the whole appeal. Uh, but but it's it's a very slender point. It, it really only gets them home for the most junior category of firms, where you frankly, and, and one can tell that from, from the rate, 118 pounds, this is clearly, other fee is, is clearly being used to refer to junior fee earners, not, not more senior fee earners, or at least the, those which the receiving party is only charging as more junior fee earners. But if your argument on the meaning of 5.11.2 is right, it must apply to everybody, not just partners and solicitors. Um, y yes, I accept that, uh, and I, and I accept, uh, and my, my my submission is that although the precedent A is unhelpful to me, it's not, it's not a sufficient basis for uh, displacing um, what I say is the sensible construction of Rule 5.11.2. Which be the first set of rules which had been drafted with internal inconsistencies? I'm sorry, my lord? Wouldn't be the first set of rules drafted with internal inconsistencies? No, no my lord. And it, it, it's an example sheet. I, I mean, I, I don't know this, but I suspect it was drafted and it hasn't many years ago. Uh, and hasn't changed. And it, it does look from what, what we see as if it's dealing with, as I say, with a small case where you've got an assistant solicitor running it under the supervision of presumably one partner. Um, and then perhaps uh, 
it's hypothecating some, and again, I don't mean this disparagingly, um, fairly routine, even menial work being done by very junior people. And you, you say it, it, you think it's been there a long time. Why does that help you? I mean, the, the, as I understand it, and tell me if I'm wrong, the rules relating to paper bills have essentially been there a long time. What's yes. new is the electronic bills part. So until we had the electronic bills part, what you found was something like 5.112, uh, and also earlier on something telling you that you could take the precedence as uh, model forms of paper bills. So, why? No, it may be that it doesn't help with great it's been a long time. I mean, as what I what I have, what I had in mind was that the the, 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 the it was maybe modelled on a system where it, where you didn't have very large numbers of peers working on the same case, and that is perhaps a more modern development. But you know, that's that's as far as I take it. And my, my better point is perhaps that it looks like it's dealing with a small case where everybody knew who everybody was, and that obviously isn't the case where you have thirty three fiona's working on a case as, as we learn from the, the the further information of the new bill here is the is the position and just thinking out loud uh, just generally thinking about there's no middle ground is there between knowing nothing and knowing the names you can't say well at the very least you need to know that there are six solicitor A's and eight solicitor B's so that at least would put you on alert to start thinking, well, I wonder who's been doing what here. There isn't a middle ground you there can isn't. read each such person no, there isn't. There each isn't. such category. No. It either means what you say it means or it means what your opponent says. Yes. You, you can't avoid that. And if, if, it, means, if it means category, um, well, I, I, I say there are lots of obviously unhelpful consequences when it comes to points of dispute, replies, narrowing the issues. And what happens if we get the answers for the first time in the replies? I mean, the paying party can put in another document, but there's nothing, as your lordships will know, that the way it works is bill points of dispute theoretically replies are voluntary. I don't, I don't really take much on that, uh, as I've no doubt the assessor will say that, uh, that they're, they're always provided, uh, and, no, and no doubt if, pay, if receiving parties habitually didn't provide them, there would either be directions in individual cases or, or the rules saying it was voluntary or optional would, would be revisited. But, but that, that's it. Bill points of dispute replies, if the paying party only gets the answers it needs, and not and potentially in quite a piecemeal fashion, not sort of running through the bill systematically, but just where challenges have been made in the replies, um, that other than getting to the hearing and hoping one can sort it out <coughs> on the day, there's, there's nothing in the detailed assessment procedure that gives the paying party another bite of the cherry to say, well, now you've told me who this person was, I want to take the point that they weren't really grade B because I've checked their status. Well, now you've told me it was two different people working on this document. I want to take the point. And that then, although points of dispute can be amended, I mean, apart from the fact that's obviously uns unsatisfactory, amendments can be, dis you can amend without permission, but the cost judge can disallow amendments. And equally, the cost judge doesn't let in points that aren't in the points of dispute without permission. Can I just ask a question I asked Mr. Brown, which was, um, why wouldn't you want to give the name of um, the people working on the bill. Is there any good practical reason There's why no can... good reason at all, and I'll make this point with even more force, when I, I'll try to make it with more force when we come to the electronic bill. There's no good reason at all. And I wouldn't, the, 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 it, it's just so, and in my respect for submission, you haven't heard from the appellant any reason except, well, that, well, we don't have to, which of yeah, course. He, he, he said, it probably takes the point, yeah. he says, on a proper construction, we don't have to. And of course, that begs the very question for your lordships. But more than that, when your lordships come to the question, one of the factors I would submit your lordships will want to have in mind is, well, is there a good reason for not construing the rule this way or for construing it that way? And all the good reason is for requiring Fiona's to be named. And again, no doubt the court's assessor will have considerable experience of this. But while I wouldn't assert that this is the only bill, or indeed I wouldn't assert this is the only solicitor who does it this way, I would suggest that, as a general matter, the experience is that most receiving party solicitors will just name the person. And just to be clear, in was that also true back in the 1990s or between 2000 and 2010? I mean, what, was it true through the whole period that we had paper bills and not electronic bills? 
that normally the Fianas would all be in it. Well, I would submit that, but I can't, I, I, yes. I, I can't assert a monopoly of experience on that. But yes, I would say that. Yes, that's right. And before you go on to electronic bills... No, well, I was, I was just going to, I was going to deal with status yes, before yeah, I did. Yeah. So did your lordship want to no, ask... No, I was going to just check you were going to deal with status. I was, go I was going to deal with status. I mean, it seems that we have essentially narrowed here because uh, although I did push for a slightly more expansive interpretation of status below, there's no respondent's notice and we accept the judge's decision that a status requires a statement, uh, with each name, the statement of the years of, uh, profession, of, of, uh, of experience for any qualified FIANA. And in the default of that, the assumption will be that the FIANA isn't, isn't qualified and or doesn't have experience. Um, so, so, I, as I understood my loans very sufficient, really, the, the issue on status has disappeared. But I do just want to make a point on that, because it, what, what's common ground is that although it might be helpful to have the SCCO grey, that's not a proper construction of the practice direction, at, at the risk of pushing my luck, if your lordships took the view that it would be helpful to state the grey, um, then it would be helpful if your lordships' judgment said so, but, but I'm not, that, that's as far as I've pushed my luck. I haven't put in the respondent's notice, and I'm not saying the grade is required. But that has an important consequence, because in the exchange between the court and my learned friend, the, the, the debate on is it possible, is it permissible to name fianas by category, once one recognises there's no requirement under these rules for grade, which of course is a term of art, what my learned friends and solicitors categorise things is not a term of art. So if it's permissible to do it by category, then you're entirely in the hands of the receiving party solicitor as to what those categories will be. Because we agree they don't have to use SCCO grades as their category. And that, in my submission, is, is going to be profoundly unhelpful. Because there's no definition of category. And if they can do it by category, then they can choose the category. Just two points occur to me. One is. In one sense, one might think that paper bills are now academic, but I suppose they're still being used regularly for cases that began a while ago. Yes, I mean, I, I, there may be. A, this, I, I mean, I'm told and, and that there's a significant tear. I mean, it's obviously yes. becoming less important as the years go by, but because of the transitional provision that says that, that uh, up to April 2018 you can use the old style bill, and surprisingly, most, in my, most receiving party solicitors still do, even though. They could simply put the whole thing in an electronic bill. Um, it, it's not an un, it's not a, an important point. And the, the other thing is, you say this problem may have gone away. I wonder whether it has. Was the judge right in paragraph 104? Uh, as I understand Mr. Brown's position, he says, OK, I accept the judge was right to say that you have to give professional qualification of any and years of post-qualification experience in relation to anybody other than grade D. But uh, as I understand it, really, there's only scope for complaints about failure to comply with that requirement in relation to the grade D type of bill. Well, no, no. I mean, our complaint was in relation to to, to all the fairness that that wasn't given. So, so, can I understand that? If we take, if we have paragraph page sixty-one of the supplemental bundle in front of us. It, oh, I, I see. Well, it becomes a narrower point. I accept that on the basis of that, um, and this does well. Firstly, it's the sixty-one again. It doesn't say whether it's post-qualification experience. But the judge hasn't. Has she said that? But she, she has said post-qualification. She, she does say post-qualification experience, which is what Cook on Costs says. Uh, I, I don't think your lordships actually have the, the relevant extract from Cook on Costs in the bundle. It's quoted by the judge. Uh, the, 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 I checked yesterday. The most recent edition says exactly the same thing. Again, the court's assessor will know about this. The, 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 the re most recent it says, it says exactly the same, save that it now simply refers to this is just a state judgment as approving what was in the previous edition. Um, but no, it does. she does talk about post-qualification experience. So I accept it becomes a narrower point. And again, there's the point I made, although this is a narrower point, about partner, two-thirds of the way down page 61. That doesn't say anything. Presumably, I think one could assume that that's not suggested to be a default grade D, looking at the rate being claimed. 
it doesn't say anything about that experience yes, that's for the public. Uh, and in relation to solicitor two, for example, or solicitor one, we don't know how many of the solicitor, how many solicitors there were within that ca no. particular category. No, we don't. And that comes back to the aggregation and anonymization point. But it does. I mean, the first question is, what does status mean? And one thinks of status as being a judge or a postman or something. But you're saying status is not just being a solicitor or being a fellow of the chartered institute or whatever it's called. It's more than that. Status, you're saying, I think, means a combination of professional qualification and plus experience. experience. Plus experience, relevant yeah. experience. And, and I think your opponent did agree that. But that's what you say status yes, is. I mean, I, is I, the qualification, the professional qualification, not the law degree, the professional qualification yes. and the post-qualification. And, and, yes. and whether, whether we're all right or wrong, as I understand that the parties both mm. agree with the judge. I mean, I haven't put a response notice. Uh, and my, as I understood my letter of submissions on that point, is with, he, he's not challenging what the judge said. Uh, and and uh, that uh, sense I, I hadn't uh, earlier on picked up the reference to post-qualification experience. And you say, well, uh, if that's, if it's accepted that by way of status you have to specify post-qualification experience, then plainly the judge is right in paragraph 104. Yes. No doubt when the judge came to paragraph 104, she also had fully in mind the, 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 the anonymization stroke name point. And I, I, I read her judgment as bringing, as, as this is being her overall conclusion based on both strands of what she saw as yes. deficiency. And being pedantic again, the reason why we read status as covering a number of years of experience is because status is what got to be read in context, and this is all about cost. This is all about and the things that relevant. When you talk about status, it's why can I charge more? Yes. Well, I'm qualified. And I've been at it for donkey yes. years. It's all about. Bluntly. It was too much of a stretch to put the word grade in as a matter of construction because that's a term of art, and there's an obvious argument. <laughs> although I tried below, there's an obvious argument that if the draftsman had meant grade, SCC had grade, he'd have said grade because we all know exactly what, what that, that means. means. Yeah, that would but have been status, shorthand, yeah. status has to be construed purposefully, and the purpose is to articulate relevant experience to justify the rate being claimed. But I accept that I, I'm, and, and that it's a purposive construction, uh, which is why I said below that this part of the argument was more finely balanced because I recognise status isn't Could just say the qualification, you are a solicitor. You wouldn't could have say, said that. You know, if somebody asked you at a party what you do, you wouldn't say, I'm a solicitor with eight years. It's got to be <laughs> they'd think you were bonkers. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I, said, I see my little lord's just as you looking at the clock. Shall I just, may I just answer that in one yeah, sentence? Yeah, do, please. No, uh, your lordship is right, but of course, and of course, what one, as anyone who does any kind of assessments will, 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 will confirm, you want to know the level of relevant experience as well as the yeah. qualification. My Lord, just if I may, just one other thing yes. in terms of just supporting that the name is required. One of the county court cases, and I don't need to go to it, it's referred to in the judgment, makes a very good point that even on a summary assessment, the summary assessment form that we have all seen, you put the name in. And it would be surprising if less detail was required on a detailed assessment. I suppose that's right, but summary ass assessments came in later, didn't they, or not? That, that is true. That, that's true. Yes, summary assessments came in. Um, in so you could hardly go through the rules as they were first introduced for paper bills by reference to what was later done to the summary assessment. I suppose it, it would be a question of saying uh, that the summary assessment was intended to be consistent with the previous rule, and it is only capable of one interpretation. Is that my Lord? Is that a convenient moment? Yes. I'll turn to electronic bills later. So, turn